Thank you for watching Behind the Gavel with Jason today. I'm so excited to bring to you our special guest today from London, England, Mr. Curtis Dowling. Curtis Dowling is a uh, art authenticator and expert in forgery and all things art and antiques. Curtis, thanks for joining us from across the pond. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. For those of you who do not know who Curtis is, uh, he is an art authenticator. He's an expert on art forgery. He uh, started as an antique dealer, Worked on, uh, was on the BBC, BBC Two, uh, Channel Four, was on Cash in the Attic, Cash in the Celebrity Attic, Hidden Paintings, Beat the Bank, uh, Sun, Sea, and Bargain Spotting, Hoarder SOS, which was an interesting show, uh, a little bit less, uh, it was kind of an interesting show to watch there, Advisor on Lovejoy, came across the pond in the United States, worked with CNBC, was an advisor for the Elizabeth Taylor Auction of a Lifetime, and was one of the three co-hosts of uh, Treasure Detectives, which was a really interesting show. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Curtis, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the antique business industry uh, and how you transferred that information and history into becoming an art forgery expert and authenticator. Simple, really. Um, started the, the usual way. Um, I spent an awful lot of time at somewhere called Portobello Market, which um, is famous in Britain and Europe for being the antique market. And my very first day, someone sent me off that I was uh, partnered up with to go and get some silver because they were running low on their store. Turned up at uh, somebody's house, said, excuse me, John needs some more silver. And the guy who opened the door said, well, well what century are you looking for? And I said, oh, I don't know. Um, I said, he just needs some more. He said, well, come in for half an hour and I'll stamp up a number of pieces from each century. So that was my first introduction to forgery, that, you know, it's almost mail order um, and there's a lot of it about. And I went through the usual channels. I had an antique shop after doing all the fairs. Um, and then I realised that after reading a book uh, about forgery, and it was written by a, 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 a forger who made furniture. And right at the end of the book, he said, after all these years of making these pieces, I couldn't tell my own work from the real thing. And wow. I thought, if a forger can't tell his own work, what chance have the rest of us got? So nice. it became a, a, an obsession. And what I found after a very short period of time is I was being asked to work with people to authenticate art rather than be in my antique shop selling things. And, you know, as everybody knows in the, the business, the business is, is you. So if someone comes into your shop, it, it should be you selling it and enjoying it and talking about it. And if it wasn't me doing it, I, I thought, well, I'll stop the shop and I'll go into this side of the business, authenticating, which obviously isn't appraising. That's a completely different thing. I have no interest in the value of an item. Um, yeah. And I've, and there we are. And 30 years, 28 years later, here I am still doing exactly the same thing. That's, that's, I, I read about this candlesticks. Now, people watch, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them below. Um, the story about which century do you want just blew my mind because we sell a fair amount of silver here. And, um, you know, we've seen things as spurious marks, but you're saying that these marks are like, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference is, is my guess. I've lost your sound, um, but oh. uh, the problem with it is you have to remember that only the bad forgers will ever get caught. So um, the good ones will never, ever, ever get caught out because technology is, is amazing. Their skill is astounding. Um, so when I've said in the past, 40% of art is forgery, um, you know, even, even Thomas Hoving at uh, the, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art said 40% of his collection was forged. He just wished he knew which 40% it was. Um, and when we start looking into things, it's nearly always about 40%. Yeah, and, and it's an interesting it's an interesting statistic because I've seen that over and over again. Can you still are you having problems hearing me yet or are you hearing me good? Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, I've seen that number. I've seen the the was it Switzerland uh, art? They said up to fifty percent. Now they're only being shown pieces that have questions, so that makes more sense that they're a little higher. Yeah. Um, 
Is there, real quick before we go further, is there a difference between a fake and a forgery? Uh, I, I've seen that distinguished a little bit. Well, uh, technically, a fake is something that is has been uh, uh, embellished, really. So a fake could be something that um, it could have been aged, it could have been worked up a bit, um, it could have a false provenance added to it, and there, there we are at the moment, it seems to be the talk of the town. Uh, a forgery, it, it's been made from scratch. You know, someone sat down at the lathe and made that fake Saxon sword. Um, and I say that because one got made yesterday that will be at auction next month. Uh, um, so, uh, technically, th uh, there is a difference, but the reality of it is, you know, if it's wrong, it's wrong, isn't it? So let's jump to the fake provenance you just brought up. Just this week in New York, uh, a couple of dealers who worked for Fortuna Fine Art were arrested for creating fake provenance for antiquities they were selling. This is not a new phenomenon. The Getty Museum, the Koros that they have, that's most people think is a fake. They bought it as much because of the fake provenance that that had. How big of an issue do you see that? And how often do you see that being the thing that kind of tips you off is, wait a minute, this story says X, Y, and Z, and that can't be true. So the piece must not be true. Well, I think the internet has caused a lot of problems because it means research into creating a false provenance can be made easier. You know, if you're going to create something from the Titanic, a fake Titanic item, you know, now you can look at the, 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 the list of passengers, where they lived, where they ate, who, where they died, who their relatives were. You can do all that at the click of a button. 30 years ago, you know, you had to sit in a library, you know, and hope no one caught you out um, because your fact might not be accurate. Whereas now, here we are, you know, at the click of a button, you can look at the passenger list in first class second. So you can create that false provenance very, very quickly. Again, only the, the, the sloppy forger or faker will get caught because that genius faker and forger will make sure his information is so accurate that, uh, that he will have created an audit trail, if checked, that will confirm his story. Um, once again, you know, that's become more difficult to, to find out. But the truth of the matter is that I think you just get a feel, don't you, about the item or the story. And if you get a feel that something's not right, generally it is. You know, we all have, none of us have been missed out. We're all good at something, aren't we? Thank God. Luckily, yeah. you know, luckily some of us find the thing that we're good at and we turn it into our job. Other people, could be a good violinist or, you know, they just might be really nice people. Um, just that little thing that bothers you is the thing that kind of always sets us off on the trail. And maybe, you know, maybe this job found me and I didn't find it. Um, and I, I liken that to, if you, I stood you on top of the freeway where you are, you could probably name every car that goes underneath the bridge. You've never learned it. And you're probably not interested, but you can name them. It's subliminally just, I think, well, if we've been looking at forgeries for 30 years, when you look at something or the story, there's just something about it. You think, this stinks a bit. And I think that kind of might make you focus on one particular part of it. And, and, and because I think we know what rabbit hole to go down generally to break the story or a piece, we kind of get there relatively quickly now um, but it's an enormous problem I mean of course it is you know you stood outside Canterbury Cathedral a thousand years ago people were selling you bits of the cross they were selling you right. pieces of the Turin child you know so it's always going to be there just look on the internet and I won't mention company names but if you look at um, uh, a lot of the websites that sell things is that really you know Jordan signed T-shirt. Is that really Joe DiMaggio's signature? Is uh, there's a great story? I'll be brief on it, but this is probably the, the, the one that uh, that makes us always question everything. A woman back in 1986 bought an Elvis Presley scarf from the king himself. There's a signed photograph as well, uh, but also there's a photograph of her receiving the scarf from Elvis at the concert. That is solid gold provenance, isn't it? So she right. sold it for $1,000 because they couldn't pay their mortgage. 
Cut forward 12 months and she's on the telephone to her friend and her friend had just bought an Elvis scarf as well. When it arrived, it was the picture and it was the same thing. To cut a long story short, she sold the Elvis scarf and the picture of her receiving it. And her husband said, why don't we just keep by it selling scarves and reproduce the picture? So the picture and the story was absolutely true. The scarf was false. They sold a thousand scarves accompanied by a thousand pictures for a thousand dollars a piece until someone caught them. Holy cow. So sometimes the item is fake. Sometimes the item is fake and the story is true. Sometimes the story is fake and the item is genuine and it's obviously embellished to give it a higher value or stop it being dodgy if it's been stolen. Um, I would say 60 or 70% of all stories that we get from a provenance item, whether they're solid gold or not, are not right. And that's a fairly poor batting average, isn't it? When you're spending thousands or hundreds of pounds on something that's going to be a great item. Yeah, and, and we see that all the time. And everything from the innocent misunderstanding of a family story to the creation of a story from scratch um, that, that just will blow your mind. And like you said, if something doesn't feel right, a little bit of research, you can figure out, oh, that just didn't happen there. There's no way it could have. But that's scary when yeah. somebody reproduces their own history. Uh, I think you just talked yeah. about this astrolab that had that happen, right? Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's, I could reel you off hundreds of stories, um, but I, I think sometimes the ones that are most <laughs> difficult when they're family. Uh, we had uh, yeah. Neil Armstrong's cufflinks that he took with him to the moon because they had a bag they could take anything. He took these cufflinks that Nixon had given him. You know, and so the grandson brings them in, they're worth half a million dollars. Uh, and the story is that Nixon had taken the cufflinks off and given them to Armstrong prior to them going to the moon. On his return, Armstrong wears the cufflinks to an inaugural dinner and the chef comes out and the meal is so good he takes the cufflinks off and he gives them to the chef to say thank you. Feasible. And granddad, the chef, had been living out on that story his entire life. His family were famous locally because of it. Well, cut a very long story short, we spent many, many hours on our knees in the Nixon Museum in California. And we found a photograph of that dinner where he gave the cufflinks away. Guess what? He wasn't wearing any. Mm. So he couldn't have given the chef the cufflinks because he had a button shirt and so did everybody else. Uh, to break that story, it's kind of a long story, short, um, the cufflinks had just been something that he picked up with a magazine um, about the moon landing and he was a fairly dull sort of chap, so he made the story up. And also, <laughs> There wasn't celebrity chefs in 1969, and he he sold him on the he sold the story on the fact that he was very well known and a bit of a celebrity chef. So that that was a tough call to tell the grandson. Sorry, they're worth twenty five dollars if you want to sell them on the internet. They're not worth half a million dollars, which is going to pay off your mortgage. Um, so when it's just about money, it's easy to say I'm sorry, your story's wrong. When it's a family story, a family tradition that you break. It, they're the tough calls and someone's paid you to tell them that they're wrong. That's the worst bit. Right. So speaking of telling people things are wrong, you do this for a living, uh, authenticating art and antiques. How many, how much, like how busy are you? How, how many pieces do you see or look at in a week, a month, a year? And what kind of percentage are you seeing as being fake in those who are asking you to look at those things? Okay. Um, we get a lot of emails and a lot of requests um, uh, in the hundreds. Uh, every every week um, and they can range from uh, a Rembrandt or a Rubens or a Picasso from an auction house or a gallery or a bank uh, right the way down to someone who's bought something in a yard sale who genuinely thinks they've stumbled across the crown jewels and they want it authenticated because it's going to change their life so we're very cautious which cases we take because 
we have to make sure that um, we want to make sure we take a case that will have a conclusion. We want to sh make sure we take a case that the person could afford it. And mm. um, we also want to make sure that we take a case that actually, to be honest, that's fascinating and interesting. There's only so many Picasso sketches you can look at. Um, so we try and make sure that we, we take on uh, ones that, that will excite. Um, probably you can take on probably three or four a week and I'll tell you why I say that sounds like a high number two or three you can probably turn around very quickly based on your experience and save that person a lot of money a lot of heartache or if it's at the top end a lot of insurance premiums if it's an auction house or if it's a bank then it might take a little longer so you're probably only taking on one of them every couple of weeks and then quite often you have collections that people want you to go through and then maybe one a month. And collections are always difficult because 99.9% .9 of the time, a gallery or a dealer or a private collector will, will start the conversation like this. I want you to come and check, check everything for me, but you won't find any fakes in my collection. And that's probably, but the line we hear more than anything else, guess what? The question you yeah. just asked about what percentage, it will always be no less than one in five. It will never be less than one in five. And I'd love it to be far less than that, but it isn't. And that goes for any museum, any gallery, any collection. It's about one in five will be one of two things. It will be a fake or a forgery, or it will be a very serious misattribution. Mm. So, you, uh, you know, so collectors, you know, might save themselves a lot of insurance money if, if they got insured. Banks might save themselves a lot of face uh, and embarrassment. Um, and auction houses aren't setting a ticking time bomb by selling something that they just know in two or three years is coming back through their door with an angry face and a lawyer behind them. Um, yeah. So there's lots of good reasons. Um, and we try to work with the people, I shouldn't say this ever, I say it too many times, but people that genuinely you know, need that our item to be genuine, we kind of sometimes work with them, you know, free. <laughs> um, <you> know, <laughs> to be able to rubber stamp an item that can change someone's life who has no money. You know, we had a couple mm. not that long ago who, respectable couple, own house, paid it off, both respectable people, and they had a car accident and uh, they were in hospital a long time and their insurance stopped paying out. So the house went, the car went, the savings went, everything went. So they went from being set up for retirement to being pretty much, you know, in a, in a trailer park um, mm. and they had one thing, one thing that Gran had given them um, that they thought might be worth some money. Well, good news it was. Um, and they got themselves back in a relatively sensible position. Um, yeah. uh, so they're the nice stories, um, but it's sadly still a very high percentage that something is very wrong. But when there's money involved, there's always going to be, isn't it? Yeah, and like you said before, this is this has been a, an issue for millennia. Like you know, pieces of the cross, you know, yeah. through the Chrysler forgeries in the '60s, um, to the Nadler, Nadler Gallery now. I mean, just this spring, Major Lick was released by Barry Average, uh, a movie just about the Nadler Gallery and the what was it eighty-seven million dollars of the paintings that were all fake, painted in a garage in was it Brooklyn or Queens? I mean, it's this is always has and always will happen. We've been produced. I was presented with a painting um, that would have been my first six-figure painting, and then the the letter that came with it just didn't look right. And I ended up going to the original source, and I could have sold as many as long as I wanted. Yeah. And you know, we we we, we reached out to some people I know, Robert Whitman, uh, and other people uh, in 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 the policing aspects of it. And I don't know what's happened with it since, but you know those things are out there and they will continue to be out there. Which brings me to you, you work with auction houses quite a bit. Um, 
you know, several years ago, Sotheby's bought Orion Analytical to be do the forensics on paintings. And they had questions about how much work do you do for auction houses? Um, and what is the general relationship between you, people like you, and auction houses? I can see positives and negatives from the auction houses uh, about people like you. Well, tell me a little bit about that relationship. Okay, well, um, I guess it depends which is what the auction house is. Um, uh, just touching on the technical testing side, we no, don't only authenticate, we forge as well. So we fake things to test and train ourselves. We forge and test things to see how the forger might have got it wrong. And I can tell you, black and white, um, we can forge most things now that will pass all the technical tests you want to give it. Because it's a bit like chip and pin. You know, the minute chip and pin came out, there was people working on how to get around it to, to forge debit cards and credit cards. So we can get around every test. So uh, it doesn't mean it's not important to technical test, but, you know, it's, uh, um, it's something we can get around. So we don't take too much notice of it. The bigger auction houses, maybe we were a bit brash 20 odd years ago, but I remember walking around Sotheby's in Bond Street and we'd had these stickers made up that were uh, silver and once you stuck the sticker on, it isn't coming off. It's one of those. And we walked around a viewing day of old masters sticking stickers on the fakes and it's the sticker said, this is fake. We were just sticking stickers on. And yeah, and we got ejected of course, um, and we said to some of these, okay, look, if we can prove they're fakes, then do you want to work with us? If you can prove they're genuine, then, you know, hands up, we'll pay for any damage we've caused. Uh, they weren't the most pleasant people to talk to, uh, and one of their very senior people said, who cares if we're sending things like that? What difference does it make? You know, some we sell are good, some are bad. We make mistakes. If we do, we'll apologise. So that, I don't think they're our friends. Um, and then you get down the food chain and you're right. We could be seen as negative in an auction house, but we're not trying to upset anybody. We're just trying to save everyone the grief that comes afterwards. You know, so if you are, auction houses, you know, I travel all around the world. One thing I can always think about an auction house is they are busy. They are taking in stock. They are selling stock. They have to believe a good percentage of the things that are being said to them, because if they were authenticating everything that came through, they would have to only have a sale once every three years. And if they're picking out 40% of everything that they're selling because it potentially is wrong, then they'll all be broke. Right. So, it, you know, it's a completely different type of business. It's a sales business that has to make profit and a sensible, honest call has to be made by the auction house. Is that most probably okay to sell? If we've worked with auction houses, all we've tried to do is say, this could be wrong because they don't have the money for us to work on every piece. Otherwise, you know, we, and, and also the time frame. So when we work with auction houses, we've if it's a particularly big important sale or a particularly big important piece, we've come in and we've we've gone through it. And sometimes we've gone through it and said, yeah, you don't want to sell that one. We know that one. That was painted by so and so ten years ago. Or we think this is wrong. The, the, the provenance you've been given. And I hope over the years, hope that we've saved auction houses litigation. I hope we've saved sellers embarrassment and i hope we've saved buyers from parting with their hard-earned money um when uh, they're buying things that are wrong um i think the only time we've had negative responses is when um we've we've been bought in and they see us impacting on their profits when we've said, I'm sorry, you can't sell that. We had one in uh, Arizona four or five years ago. We went, we, we went into a collection and the a percentage of that collection was incorrect provincing and a small percentage of that collection had uh, a criminal past. 
and, uh, and that collection was big and it was worth a lot of money and publicity to the auction house and they basically said okay well you need to leave us alone and go away and they uh, attempted to sell it um and it and it, and it and it caught up with them let's just say um but i think mm. look, the majority of our business is honest the majority of auctioneers are honest and hard working the majority of dealers are just a hive of fabulous knowledge and they just want to educate their, their, their clients and earn a living out of something they love but because of the amount of money involved look do you want to smuggle heroin or do you want to fake a, a painting you know right. what's easy you know so a criminal activity will always creep in and greed obviously in our business will always be there so there's an element that will always catch us out and like i said to you at the beginning the best forgers do not get caught so yes of course they can fool sotheby's christie's bonhams the british library because they are experts in their job and they know exactly what they're doing and our job what we see our job is as the last 30 years is to get in there and cut them off at the pass before they can get their pieces sold um we have to walk a fine line because we learn from forgers we learn from forgers so we can stop innocent people buying them and innocent businesses selling them right what do you think um there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about blockchain technology affecting positively this conversation um, have, what, what do you, have you seen much of that enacted and what do you, th I mean, it seems like, like you said, the, the, the chip on our debit cards, it seems like something that could be faked once you know it's out there, but have you, what have you seen so far in blockchain? Well, say, I think because we only take on certain cases, um, our experience is limited. Um, and any form of forgery has, any form of forger or forgery has made a mistake. Nothing can, is invaluable and nothing, we, I think we've got enough experience to be able to catch anything out. Um, so I think our experience of it is limited, but uh, I guess uh, the, in the years to come, we'll probably see a lot more and I'll be able to answer that question with a few stories. Yeah, I would imagine that it's still new enough where you're not seeing things forged with it because it's not, it's not a standard in the industry yet. I mean, once it starts to become more and more prevalent, It'll yeah. be something that the forgers look to knock off. Yeah, I think so. You know, um, forgery is a funny old thing um, because some forgers stick to what they know. Um, and, you know, they'll only do old masters or they'll only do documentation or they'll only do porcelain. Or there's almost a fashion in forgery. Don't forget forgers, a lot of them do it for the kudos of being able to rip people off or make people look stupid. You know, there's always a reason, um, but you also have to remember it's a business. So as fashion changes, you'll find forgers say, well, I used to forge, you know, Chippendale reproduction furniture, but well, who buys brown furniture now? So now I forge, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jacques Cartier. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, you, you do see, uh, uh, certainly now, um, certainly with, a lot of antiques becoming less uh, valuable. A lot of collectibles now becoming valuable. You know, this week alone, I've seen two fake Louis Vuitton suitcases. Mm. Um, you know, from the 1920s. Uh, but they were created uh, by hand uh, in Romania about three months ago. Uh, the forger is, is fantastic uh, because his aging process is brilliant. Um, but a couple of the linings he's used inside are wood that dates to only 30 years old. Um, oh. So we know they're forgeries because we can now, as you, the pack of cards starts to fall once you find one thing. Once you can hang your hat, this is a fake forgery. Then you can start looking for other things. It's really strange. It's like Jan van Meergram. Who, who was a, a master forger a hundred odd years ago. You look at his forgeries now and you think, really, that fooled everybody? Because, right. because people know what to look for. Now, everybody's slightly more educated in that for lots of reasons. They've seen more, the internet, you can flick through every single painting of everybody. And people are a bit sharper maybe. 
we always think we're smug at 50 years later, though, we, you know, we, of, course we do. <laughs> of course it's a forgery. You know, and I guess that smugness carries through. We're all, all guilty of it. What do you mean you don't go to the gym? You smoke cigarettes? You know, I think that smugness is just generational. And it's certainly looking at old forgers, uh, old forgers, we do look and say, blimey, I can't believe it fooled anyone. Um, and I'm sure in 30 or 40 years time, we'll be looking back on forgeries or to other people will saying, God, it took Curtis Downing two weeks till we had realized that, that was wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. No, that's, that's absolutely true. We, you know, as a society, we get smarter every day and we have more knowledge so. to, to call from every day. And it, the same holds true for antiques and art. So it makes perfect sense that, what fooled somebody a hundred years ago is it not going to fool somebody today? Um, just real quick before we wrap things up, do you have any tips for people who are considering investing or buying higher value pieces? Are there two or three things they should look for or can keep in the back of their mind when they're looking to buy things like this? Because you know that's that's a we talk about all these fakes and forgeries, and somebody's looking to spend some significant money. What should they be looking for? What can put their mind at ease other than outside of hiring someone like you? Okay, well, I'll answer that in a, a way you might, might not expect. Um, okay. When I started 30 years ago, in my town was 30 antique shops. Each antique shop specialized in something different. Uh, and um, most of them, uh, young or old, did it because it was a passion. So mm -hmm. their customers might be spending 10%, 15% more than you know they should be because it's a shop. But two things I can guarantee you, the collections those collectors built up by working with that dealer were beautiful. And secondly, 99% mm -hmm. of the time that dealer was doing his absolute best to keep that customer and also educate that customer. Come forward 30 years, the town that I had my first antique shop in hasn't any antique shops. It's got a lot of nail bars and spas and clothes shops for teenagers, but there's no antique shops anymore. Yeah. So those relationships collectors had with a dealer have to be built up in different ways. So the, the, always the tip now, if you're not, bringing people like us in is find yourself an auction house or a dealer or both that has a permanent address that you can turn up at to have a cup of tea and a chat and get to know them personally and a business that has an element of comeback. Because if I'm sure if someone walked into your auction house tomorrow and said, I bought this here and I think it's wrong. If you genuinely thought that person had bought something that was wrong, you would have your hand in your pocket, giving them their money back before, because your reputation you have built up over all this time will be smashed to pieces if you, if you don't play straight. Right. And the benefit of the internet now is people like us, if we get it wrong, it will be all over the internet within days. Yes. So we are very accountable for our actions with what we do with customers, which we weren't 30 years ago. What would you do? Write to the newspaper. I think that Mr. Dowling was wrong. Now you can have your say. And that's a really good thing. So <clears throat> tips about buying a piece, we'd be here for doomsday because you know we're still learning and we're doing our best to continue to do so. Right. But if you can find a good auction house and or a good dealer to work with, if you're buying things, you're pretty much giving yourself a cracking insurance policy. 30 years ago, if you walked into an auction house in Britain, it was all dealers. Now you walk in and it's 75% general public because television programs, God bless them, have told people to get out there, do it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. They are a forger's dream, these people. People who think they know what they're doing and they're shopping. So, my advice is if you're spending money, whether it's for fun or investment, stop shopping, link up with a dealer, link up with an auction house, learn from them, enjoy learning from them, buy from them. Yeah, it's costing you 10, 20% more. So what? 
you're buying genuine stuff. And if it yeah. isn't genuine, that dealer or auction house will have their hand in their pocket to give the money back to you straight away. So buying things off the internet, buying things from, if, if you haven't made those relationships, that's where I think the danger really lies. That's, that's great advice, Curtis. Um, that's kind of all the questions I have for you. I like to give my guests a few minutes at the end of our interviews. You yeah. Talk about anything you want to, I'm the screen to you. Uh, you have any projects coming up you want to talk about? Anything about the industry or business at all? Tell, tell my viewers, tell the people watching, anything you want to about the industry, your business, anything you want to. Okay, well, let's try and give them a little bit of education. Don't want to talk about me. Uh, okay. Want to talk, talk about them. Um, Certainly. I, collecting has gone through the roof, I think. I think we're, we're all, we all collect something, whether it's memories or bicycles or something, but collecting has gone through the roof, and the internet has exploded that. And a great deal of the calls we get now are, are a, a slightly different type of person. If I go back just 15 years, it was all banks, building societies, auction houses, museums, big buyers. I mean, buyers spending half a million upwards, big sellers wanting to make sure that what they were selling was right. Now, because of the internet, people are buying John Lennon's signature. They're buying, you know, it isn't every pair of glasses. John Lennon's glasses isn't every. So now what we're finding is that there's an enormous amount of people coming to us who are who have bought, which is that's so they've already spent their money uh, and they've bought something on the internet. It's turned up. It's wrong. Or, um, so the market for forgery has gone boom because you know. Yeah like the Elvis scarf, you know, now there is a ream of sports memorabilia, uh, all, all this stuff being sold on a daily basis. And I'll give you a, a statistic. 4% uh, of every Beatles signature sold is genuine. Did you say four? 4%. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and I tell you why, I got that from the horse's mouth. I did the Beatles Antiques Roadshow and we had Ringo Starr with us, uh, who, if he's watching, is the grumpiest man in the world. Um, <laughs> and the grumpiest man in the world. Um, he, uh, he talked us through how these things were done and, and who was signing for them. And it wasn't the Beatles generally signing their autographs, it was Mal Evans. Uh, and obviously their fame means that everyone wants to copy it. And if there's one missing, they add one. But he told us why that wouldn't be the case. Or, so, yeah, 4%. I would say something like a 1,000 Beatles signatures a day are sold on the internet, of which 4%. So what I'm saying is that people who are out there listening to this and love collecting, want to get into collecting, start doing stuff standalone once you've established your knowledge with somebody or with a business that can run with you. Otherwise, the problem that I'm trying to fight will get worse because mm. the smugness we come back to of, there's no fakes in my collection. Well, guess what? At least 20% of everything you've bought, Mr. Collector, Mr. Auction person, Mr. eBay person, it is. So that's mm. not my opinion. That's a fact. If you want my opinion, it'll be about 40 to 50%. So let's try and cut that down. Let's try and wear an antiques version of a face mask and let's social distance from, uh, from buying rubbish from people who by the time it's arrived on your doorstep have closed that account and moved on to other things. So you yeah. know, the, those two guys that were uh, arrested in New York, um, if you arrested everybody that made up fake provinces, you'd have every FBI person in the world making an arrest every 10 seconds. You know, it's just mm. story. It's what the human race does. So I'll circle back to where we started when we were talking uh, about how the tip. It's a big problem. It'll continue to be a big problem. High and low, 10 million pounds, $500. It's just the same problem. It's still fake and forgery and you're buying junk. So, uh, 
the best advice for me, again, is find yourself someone you can love and trust with a permanent address and work with them. And the chances of you getting caught will be reduced massively. I think that's some of the best advice I've heard in a long, long time. Curtis, thanks so much. Folks, if you're watching, curtisdowling.co.uk is his website. You can reach out to Curtis at curtisdowling and icloud.com. And you can follow Curtis on LinkedIn. He has a great profile there. He's very active. He posts things almost every day and they're intriguing. They're, um, they, they, at least they make me click and read what he's posting about because he has, he, he was actually very good today. He didn't actually mention auction houses and, and companies and people by name. Although I have seen him do so in different presentations around the world. So uh, Curtis, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for joining us. And for everybody watching, I appreciate you watching us here today. Uh, you bang the gal with Jason every Friday. Next week, I'll have Martin Cooper and Karen Suwin Cooper of the Punctilious Mr. P's Place Card Company, a completely different topic. We're going to be talking about their business and fine living. You can always send us, send us questions at info at K. Oh, that's not what I got going on here. Hide that one. Uh, you can ask us questions at info at kcauctioncompany.com. Send us a phone call at 816-283-3633. Thank you so much for watching. Curtis has already jumped off. He's over in London working really hard. If you have any questions, let us know. Appreciate you watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next Friday.